I hate hard opens like this, to be fair. Hey, my name's CJ. Um, a couple of weeks back, a friend of mine asked me about free-to-play MMOs on consoles. So, Xbox One, PlayStation 4. There were a couple out on the market. There's uh, someone such as uh, Skyforge, amongst others. And I thought, what one of the best ways to go through it is to kind of not compare the free, but compare my experiences with the free because uh, I was hooked on WoW back in the day, not as much as some of my other friends, but uh, that as well as Final Fantasy XIV. I've got that on my PC, absolutely love it. Uh, a friend of mine's got the PlayStation 4, so the ones that I'm about to talk about are all fully available on there. Crossplay with PC as well for, I think, two out of them are crossplay. I'm not entirely sure that I might be wrong on that. But yeah, so here are my experiences, hope you enjoy the video. While only released a week ago for both Xbox One and PS4, Terra's actually been around since 2011. Released around the same time as Rift, and not long before the announcement of Wildstar, and set to take advantage of the original Final Fantasy XIV's very weak start, Terra is very much Eastern inspired in terms of mechanics. Each class requires a little bit of nuance and takes some time to learn, but it's not a tab target system a la World of Warcraft, instead making the player rely on movement, positioning and proper skill rotation to be effective. After having dumped around 4-5 to five hours of Terra on my Xbox One X, I can say that in my opinion the age is showing. It simply doesn't feel optimised for a console, let alone my One X. There are consistent frame rate drops, especially in the middle of combat. It's almost as if the game cannot handle having that many players or NPCs on a screen at the same time. Luckily these are frequent but fleeting, they never usually last longer than a second. The UI itself seems to have taken cues from Final Fantasy XIV in terms of the action and controller setup. Every button on the control face has an ability tied to it and in some cases instant combos that I can assume PC players would have to manually activate. Think insta-casting rejuvenation on a resto droid immediately after proccing no! Whilst this is incredibly handy, it does ring out to me that maybe this game has m one too many abilities tied to each class, and that doesn't necessarily translate well when you're trying to fit it onto a controller. Playing the game, I selected an Arman Mystic. The Mystic is a support class that focuses on AoE healing and buffs. However, they are able to solo very effectively with the ability to summon a tank pair and an immobile damage threat. They never actually give you a passive ability breakdown when creating a character, so I was left in the dark and seemed to have picked a relatively inefficient race class combo. I'm rolling with it though. Combat is relatively fluid, and after the first 3-4 levels you gain access to an awful lot of your arsenal, which is very daunting. A lot of menu readings required to get a full grasp on combos that might be helpful to you. For me it was a lot of my basic attack and the Y button until I unlocked both pets, then I could get really creative. And that's a real redeeming feature of the game. There is a lot of variety on how you dispatch the incredibly easy mobs. I tend to pull huge groups of enemies, use my tank to pull all of the aggro, summon the lightning AoE pet in the middle to make very short work of them, all the while I may be using my auto attacks or this bouncing heal grenade thing that just kind of crits it almost all of the time. Now, I couldn't tell you anything about the story apart from a few pointers as I don't typically play MMOs for that reason. The only one that I kind of pay attention to is Final Fantasy XIV and that's just because I'm a huge dork for that series. However, for those of you that are interested, there are five children who can see into a different realm It gives them extraordinary power, some evil bad guy empire wants to take them, harvest their abilities to take over the world, blah, blah, blah. Generic Story 101. Unfortunately, it's followed by Generic Quest Structure 101. Go to X and kill Y many Zs. Collect these many things from crates because Lord knows that Jeremy over there can't do it himself. It's all just very stale. However, if you can look past the weak writing, generic enemy types and the technical shortcomings on modern day consoles for a 7 year old port, it all could be worth a shot. I hit level 20 very quickly, in around 2.5 hours, and from there the grind begins with plenty of PvP and PvE content. 
However, be sure to get rid of the lock boxes that you come across. Not only do they ta take up the relatively sparse inventory space that you have, they also require keys that can seemingly only be obtained via the in-game shop for real world money. Not only that, they will try and entice you with their premium membership that gives you a permanent double XP boost and other benefits. I feel like it doesn't do enough to justify the monthly sub. The Elder Scrolls Online has been around for a little while now and the second major expansion, Somerset, is due for release on May 21st. In comparison to Terra, ESO was built from the ground up for both consoles and PC. However, in some ways some of the core experience of this game was clearly designed for a monthly subscription service with certain premium features and many, many mounts and other cosmetic content locked behind paywalls on their ESO Plus membership. For those not in the know, Elder Scrolls Online did start off as a monthly sub game. It came out all, it came out with a monthly sub as well as being having to buy the game itself as well so very much the world of warcraft model and final fantasy 14 model unfortunately though the player base wasn't there to sustain that which is why they switched to a free-to-play model much like almost every mmo that does try it these days Depending on your race and class combination, it seems that you start the game on different continents after the initial Sky Prison start. It's a typical Elder Scrolls start in the best feasible way, with a linear path that introduces the slew of systems available to the player and enough weapons and armour to allow you to get a starter set for your preferred class as soon as possible. After the tutorial area is complete, you are plunged headfirst into Tamriel. This is where the issues begin to arise. Whilst there is a plotline that you can follow, it isn't all that interesting. Again, all of the subtleties of the game systems are hidden away behind menus and unintuitive UI design. It pays off to have a mouse and keyboard for this, unfortunately. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of the tool is a simple affair. You have a base set of abilities that you get more and more powerful and evolve the more you use. For example, I used the teleport ability on the Night Stalker class far too much, and after it leveled up a few times I had the option to evolve it one of two ways. After the transformation, it can level up even further. This allows you to really create a custom set of abilities that tailor to your playstyle as opposed to being shoehorned in and adhering to the best abilities per class. Now there is a skill trainer on the left hand side of the skills tree which kind of pushes you in a certain direction in terms of what would be efficient to use together or maybe based on your class and other you know other factors other variables i turned it off for the night stalker because i know exactly how i want to play that i want to go full assassino teleport in go invisible stun them up life steal away and then when they get below 15 percent hp i can execute on my one that is my preferred way to play and it does pay off more often than not obviously being a um night stalker which is essentially a rogue class but with magic you are only really single target damaged way which pales in comparison to maybe a large AOE damage dealer like the wizard but you know I haven't actually come across any instances in that yet in which it would be of any use which is kind of sad. The world itself though Tamriel is vast and the enemy types are varied. There are major continents from previous Elder Scrolls games so you do obviously have um, Cyrodiil, you have Skyrim in there as well albeit not the Skyrim that people would know from the Elder Scrolls 5 um, and the first major expansion also added Morrowind. Now these areas are fantastic but the enemy types, whilst they are varied, are kind of the same old, same old. There's a bandit here, there's a bear there, there's a mud crab, there's um, the draugr, there's skeletons. Like, everything that I guess you would expect in an Elder Scrolls game, you know, that's fantastical. But nothing that really sets itself out. That being said, the combat 
the moment-to-moment -moment combat of it all is slightly reminiscent of the single-player ilk, with enemies able to hit in big areas, and they tend to hit quite hard. The difference between this and the single-player ilk being that the target indicators for enemies, they show up on the ground in like a red cone or a little red circle as to where their AoE ability is going to go, allowing you the ability to actually dodge it rather than just hoping that a giant doesn't swing its hammer down and shove you like 50 miles in the distance. The obvious difference that you'll see though is there are lots of mobs as opposed to the single player focused brethren. It does at certain point feel like it's just throwing hordes of enemies at you for the sake of it, as most don't put up much of a fight. They're still very much the binary MMO tradition of dodge the AoE, make sure the tank keeps aggro and just dump skill rotation after skill rotation on them until they all die. The ability to switch between first and third person is quite jarring and doesn't really add anything other than confusion to the experience. That's, although that being said, it's for my class kind of redundant, I guess, but for maybe a ranged class such as a ranger or um, the mage classes, I guess it can be kind of helpful because a third person, you can, you know, judge distance better. After roughly 30 hours with the game across PC and Xbox One and around about 4 or 5 characters, I say that I've probably had my fill. I can see it being a time sink with player housing, various guilds and side quests on offer. It just didn't grab me. Not like the other MMO experiences that are out there and certainly not like what the single player versions are. It tries to pull the single player freedom of the core Elder Scrolls games, but the communal aspects of MMOs don't quite mesh that well with it which is really sad considering the last time i picked up skyrim me and my brother were saying how amazing would it be if we were able to take dragons down together i don't feel like the magic formula worked for this but you know they tried and that was what's important here Fully entrenched in the forgotten realms of classic Dungeons & Dragons lore, Neverwinter is the action MMO that doesn't quite know what it wants to be. In some ways, despite being younger than Terror in its lifetime, it feels the oldest out of the three. I was playing this on Xbox One, and you'd think that graphically this is an end-of-life Xbox 360 slash PS3 game. Aesthetically, almost everything in this game has the feel of what I would imagine Dungeons & Dragons to be if it wasn't all in our heads. Old wooden houses, dark and dingy caves full of bandits and otherworldly creatures, and righteous knights that pray to the deities for power. Yet, you are just another adventurer, and that's both a blessing and a curse. I say a blessing and a curse in that being another adventurer is perfectly fitting for the setting of D&D. However, not long after the tutorial, you are thrust into some large overarching campaign in which you're suddenly one of the few people to save the world. Well, if collecting wolf pelts or killing various bandit factions counts as saving the world. The quest structure is very much in the fashion of the Undisputed Kings of MMOs, wow. You have a series of towns and settlements that you are progressing through, completing the same string of quests over and over, just with different enemy models and slightly more health. Even here, as a guardian fighter, a tank, I have little to no issue almost one-shotting these mobs. Whilst it is great to feel powerful, I'm not being challenged as a tank. I will say that it is handy that the game incorporates companions that are persistent and upgradable, allowing me to skill my character in a true tank fashion without needing to be careful about my solo experience. The UI during gameplay isn't too bad, although the giant dice in the middle of your action bar for your heroic abilities is a bit unsightly. It's almost as if they're trying to bash you around the head by saying, hey, it's D&D, you know? No! The action bars correspond with the face buttons, and LB slash L1 switches between the two, much like Terra and most other MMOs on consoles. What is rather welcome though are the solo instances that take you out of the high respawn rate mobs. Whilst I have no idea about the story, these solo instances provide a nice break for that have bosses at the end providing slightly more of a challenge than that of the generic enemies outside. Stylistically, they are mostly the same, just maybe a bigger character model. At least the chest at the end gives you some nice gear. 
Speaking of gear, inventory management in this game largely sucks. I'm forever spending time in the menus discarding obsolete or unequipable gear just to be able to pick up a plethora of items in the field that are either for quests or other side pieces. Gems for gear, die for item customization, etc, etc. You do eventually get access to a second bag with the space for another 5 extra bags if you're willing to purchase their premium currency. Thus, this leads me to my biggest gripe with Neverwinter. Much like Terra and Elder Scrolls Online, Neverwinter lives or dies on its ability to generate revenue through microtransactions, whereas Terra and ESO have them there and they continually prompt you to check out their store, Neverwinter is much more audacious and it peppers you with notifications about other players who have gained epic mounts or gear from lockboxes that they found in the world. The trick to these chests is that you must spend Zen in order to get the keys to unlock them. If you aren't careful, your inventory will soon be full of lock chests that you may well not want to spend real world money on. And if you don't, from my experience you seem to have a tough time finding anything of real value gear wise. These are so off putting to me, trying to gouge me for money here and there in an attempt to give me a false sense of value in my progression. Now. That's not to say that I'm against microtransactions, I played League of Legends for five and a half years now and have spent almost a grand if not over a grand on that game in terms of buying champs, room pages, skins etc. Gun. Mouth. Now. I know when I want to spend extra money on a game if I feel like it's worth the money. It's just, unfortunately, these three don't. So in conclusion, MMOs, especially free to play MMOs on consoles at the moment, they largely suck, unfortunately. The best one is one that you have to pay a monthly sub for and that's Final Fantasy XIV. It offers you a ton of content, it offers you rewards for resubbing. Uh, just in the t uh, you know new pets maybe a new cosmetic item or something like that just as a little thank you for staying subscribed to them but with the you know with ESO with Terra with Neverwinter they're too intent on trying to say hey here's this thing why don't we just take this thing and make you pay for something else in order to unlock that thing how fantastic is that it, it doesn't work for me. I don't like it personally. However, you know, they can be great time sinks if you want to uh, grind it out. I know the Terra in particular was developed over near Korea, you know, for those Korean Chinese servers that they love to grind. Um, the Chinese gold farmers back in the days of WoW, you know, selling it for God knows how much. But yeah that's that was my thought on them if you're going to play any free to play game that maybe doesn't gouge you or maybe doesn't continually say hey check out this thing that you can purchase or you feel like you have to in order to get any form of progression try warframe warframe is fantastic it's probably the best looking free to play game you're ever gonna find and after watching the no clip documentary yesterday on um, the development process of that game, it's insane and I hopefully we're gonna spend a lot more time with it. It is very loot centric, the combat though is absolutely amazing. The fact that they turned a bug into a whole parkour mechanic, just the way you can dart through these levels so quickly is just amazing. So that's definitely worth checking out. Anyway, my name's Callum, I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, I'll see you next time. Peace.